of Yeshua. We bless you for this Sabbath, and we thank you for all that you have done in creation. We bless you and thank you so much because you are worthy to be praised. Father, your goodness and your loving kindness towards us cannot be matched. We ask you to protect our loved ones, Father. We ask you to watch over our pastor and his wife and bring them home safely to us, Lord, as they travel. Give them safe passage and allow them, Father God, to come back to tell us about the joys and things that have transpired by your spirit in the midst of our brothers and sisters in Panama. And Lord, we ask right now that you would come and sit with us. Let your spirit rest upon each and every one of us, that our worries and our cares we would be able to cast off to you, that we may hear what you have to say today. Use these lips of clay, Father God. Mold them and shape them to speak that which only comes from your throne. And that which is of my flesh, don't allow it, Father in the name of Yeshua. And all God's people said amen. 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 So we're going we're gonna to finish um, part two of repentance and just the title we gave it, coming from Psalms 32. And um, we're going to back up just a tad. We'll look at verse one. We won't read through because we read through it before, but let's start this time with verse two. And then I'm going to Cover just a little bit, and then we'll move on and finish it. Amen? <clears throat> uh, verse 2. All right, so it says there, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And we said last week that, that this was a person that had, although they had sinned and had a transgression, against the Lord, and by the way, a transgression against the Lord is also a transgression against our fellow man. Amen. So when we transgress against one another, we have transgressed against the Lord. Amen? Because sometimes people don't make a distinction that they're all one and the same. So they feel like, well, I may go to church and I do this and I do that, but if you've wronged your brother or your sister, you have offended the Lord. Amen? So even though they've sinned, this man or this person has repented so sincerely that God ascribes no sin to him, having forgiven him completely. Now, uh, as I was looking back over this again, the reason why I wanted to start from this point is because the word in the, in the commentary was completely. Sometimes we forgive one another halfway. So sometimes, you know, okay, you, 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 we, you've asked to be forgiven and, and, and we've hugged each other and we said okay, but the thing is not completely settled in your heart. Amen? So again, we are to model ourselves after our Messiah. So he says when someone has sincerely repented and repented and forsaken what they have done, which means now you got to leave it alone. So you can't keep saying to people when you transgress, well, would you forgive me? Uh, I'll give you a good example. If you got a problem with your mouth, if your tongue is too loose and you offend somebody and you can be sincere about, I'm sorry that I did that, but you now have to forsake doing that. You have to get rid of that, and that means that's why you have to learn something. You have to make a concerted effort and you need the Holy Spirit to do it, to help rid you of that kind of behavior. Amen. So this way, when, when, when in, in this case, the Lord is saying, when someone has sincerely come to me with a true heart, and believe me, he knows it. He knows if you fake it. He knows if you're just trying to get the heat off of you. But when that has happened, he says, I forgive you completely. And that's what it means to say, I've thrown that sin in the sea of forgetfulness. I will never recall it upon you again because you have truly and sincerely done it. Well, if the Lord shows us that example with us, that's how we ought to be with one another, that we completely let that thing go. And, and don't let our evil inclination or the enemy or anybody bring it back to us. Amen? 
So they, it, he's forgiven them completely. And it also says, it speaks of the person being one who has improper thoughts to enter his mind but have not committed the deed. Sometimes we get thoughts. And I, and I, got, a, I got kind of a, a running joke sometime with some of the people that I work with. And they'll ask me, well, why do you do certain things? Because a lot of times we want to see people punished all the time. And I make a joke and I say, well, what's going on in my head sometimes is not what I'm going to do. Because it wouldn't be right with God. But see, that just lets you know that you got a buffer somewhere. You have a filter that allows you to do that. And that's why it's important for us to know the word of God and, and to allow the Holy Spirit to show us the way to go. Because sometimes what immediately comes to our thoughts, if we did that, it would be terrible. But because we have the advocate with us, our paraclete, our Holy Spirit to be with us, then we can curb that thought. So this falls in that area too. And Jesus was warned, has warned us about our thoughts because they carry that seed of the deed. So whatever we are thinking is what we're going to carry out. Amen? So we have to be careful. So if the wrong thoughts come up on us, we need to do something about it, and we need to do something about it immediately. Uh, it ties into what Proverbs says, um, anger rests in the bosom of a fool, right? And the fool is one who lacks the knowledge of Torah. That's one. So how much more is that when we speak about iniquity, meaning that we know better, and then we still don't do what's proper? Amen? So we got to watch that. We got to be very careful with that. All right, so let's go to, um, I also had a note here about this person is free of deceit, of deceitful repentance. Now, think about this, think about this word, these two words, deceitful repentance. Now, most people will say, well, you repent, you repent. Well, the rabbis are saying there is a way to be deceitful in your repentance, which means that you're really just getting the heat off you and you want people to think or appear that you've changed. And you haven't. Amen? So God, God knows. He knows it. He, he knows exactly where you are. You can't fool him. Amen? Yes. Where that mic at? I want it on tape. This one down here. I want to, I want it, I want, I want everyone to hear what you got to say. Okay. <clears throat> Pastor Hodge, what I want to say is the teaching that you did on last Sabbath, and I called it a teaching of the living word. Amen. and a teaching of due season. Because as I digested that word and was able to go back and even study yeah. Psalms 32, Amen. because I knew that it was a living word, God revealed to me what I needed to repent for. Amen. Some I had done, and I had just gone on about my business. But he revealed to me through that teaching, you need to repent. And this was early in the morning. Amen. So I was up early in the morning. <laughs> and when you repent, the Lord had me to say, I have sinned to the That's person. Right. That's the first thing. I have sinned. You know, so um, I just thank God for a living word today. Amen. Amen. I thank God for a living word. Amen. So if we are truly digesting this word, God will reveal those things that are hindrances that's, right. that's keeping us from moving into the supernatural. That's right. Because it's a living word. That's right. So I just want to thank you so much that's right. 
that God is using you mightily Amen. to bring forth a living word. Amen. Praise God. And the thing about that is the scriptures talks about our hearts being desperately wicked. So that's what they, they, what, that's what they mean about being deceitful in your repentance. And it's not always that it's something you know. It's not always something that you are purposely trying to do. So I want to make that clear. The thing about it is if you've been deceived, you've been deceived. Whether, you are, whether that's intentionally being done or you're trying to deceive someone else or you yourself have been deceived about what's going on in your life. Amen? So that's good. So it carries the seed of the deed. And um, it also gives you the connotation that it is also compared, um, it's not compared, I should say, to those who return to sin. This person has completely and sincerely turned away from what they were doing. And, it, and uh, Proverbs, um, it's like the dog returning uh, to its vomit or the thief returning to the scene of the crime. We don't ever want to be those kind of people. We want to be those who are honest and true. And then once you, you take the proper steps to repent, then the burden of the sin is lifted off of you. And then your life becomes actually more joyful, more livable, less stress, less sickness, illness, all of that comes off of your life. Amen? So let's go to... Um, Let's see. Let's go to um, verse 3 now. Talk a little bit more about, he said, when I kept silent, when I kept silent, my bones waxed old. Now, ah, that's nice. I like the way, if you understand and study that word out, what, it, what it's saying. But I want to um, read it from here. And it gives you a much better understanding. Verse 3 says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away because of my groaning all day. Now, here's the thing. If you are a true child of God and you haven't allowed yourself to be taken over, and, and understand this, being oppressed, I'm not talking about being possessed, being oppressed by, uh, by the ad adversary, you can have your life in such a way where you could be coming to church and, and, and talking one way, but totally living a totally different thing. And, that, and that's really an oppression. So the truth is you're, you're doing a lot of hiding. You're doing a lot of things to cover up who you really are. So he's talking about the fact that my, um, I'm wasting away it's, an, it's, a, it's a certain level of anxiety because, and it's a certain amount of stress involved with trying to keep up a facade. That's not who you really are. And God is saying, that's a waste of time. Why don't you just confess, and then that's it. And there's no more bondage. There's, there's, there's nothing else for you to worry about. It cannot be held any longer because it works this way so beautifully that when we do this and repent, then even the person that you've transgressed against, they cannot hold it against you any longer and not be in trouble with God themselves. So there's a two-way. There's a, there's a repentance and an asking for forgiveness, but there's also a receiving of the person again. So when Jesus talked about it in Matthew uh, 18, he said, if your brother will hear you, you have regained them. You've been restored to one another. He said, but if he doesn't hear you, now take a witness to the fact that you are sincerely trying to make amends. Now, by the mouth of two witnesses, your repentance to that person and the asking of forgiveness has now been established as a fact that this happened. We have witness. Now, if you don't receive your brother, now you're in trouble. Now you have transgressed. Because to be in unforgiveness is a transgression. 
against the brother or sister that you got a problem with and God. Now you're in trouble. Right? So here it is, this deterioration, and that's what it is. When we don't repent, we are deteriorating. We are dying. Life is not living in us. We are dying, and it resulted from, and he said, the sighing and the groaning. Uh, I, I want you to just uh, picture a person who's just worried about his sins being found out. And an inevitable punishment that comes with it. Why in the world would we hold on to sin? Because that's what you do. If you don't confess it, you're holding on to it. And what you're doing is the prescription that will get you well, you are totally rejecting it. And it's a slow death, exactly. It's a slow death. It's a spiritual death and a physical death. Amen? So the absence of repentance caused David to worry over his fate and roared in him with anguish and stress. Isn't that something? So listen, that caused me to think, and I know that it's not a blanket situation because people are stressed for many reasons. But I kind of I feel like, look, and, and looking at this over, that many people are stressed and in anguish and have no joy because they got sin, unrepentant. David had no control over this anguish, and that's the thing. How you now feel because you have held on to this sin, you will have no control over it. It will rule over you. Amen? That's a terrible place to be. Let's look at, um, let's look at uh, four. Uh, the next verse. For the day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. And he says, think. Think about this. I anticipate your dreaded punishment day and night. The flesh is shriveled and my weight decreased as anxiety sapped my strength. You talking, to, now, first thing is, you really have to be a true believer for this to even happen to you. So that gives you a whole nother category. If you are somebody that can just sin on and, and it don't bother you, you are really in trouble. Um, Pastor Hodge, when it says about that sap too, we have to realize what happens in the physical. That's right. To a tree with yeah. sap. Sap in a tree is the fluid. That's right. It's the, the fluid in the tree right. that causes life. That's right. And when that sap leaves the tree, it means that you don't have no strength or no power. Nothing. And then that tree is easily broken. Broken. That's right. Destroyed, yeah. So, I'm, I, you know, it just, this word is just <laughs> blessing me so. Amen. Because it's being spoken over this body for a reason. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord Amen. God. To get us straight, because the Lord told us, it's time for you to come out of the holy place. Amen. See, the holy place is where in the ancient times, they conducted and honored God according to their way. Uh -huh. But God said, it's time for us to come out of that place. Right. Hallelujah. And come into the holies of holies, because I've already torn the veil. Amen. So now he's teaching us how to do it. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, this Amen. is a living word, people. Praise God. I'm telling you, it is. Amen. It's a living word Amen. from the throne of Amen. God. Amen. Amen. And we better digest it and move on into the holies of holies. Hallelujah. I'm with you. Amen. So then it, it talks about the internal fat or the moisture or the, like you said, the sap that gives vitality. So, so, you, so now, here, watch this. Can't you see depression here? Depression where people have no strength. It always talks about depressed people have no strength. Right? And depression is a demonic force. 
right? So the person that thrives in God's favor flourishes like a plant nourished by abundant water, but the sinner is parched and withered from divine neglect, right? We talked about that last week. I wanted to go back because there were some other points that I wanted to bring out, but that's where you are. So when, when there is divine neglect, and here's the thing, God does not neglect any of us, for he says, I have given everything that pertains to life or living and godliness. So this is what happens. When you live in this state unrepented, you cause the divine neglect because now you don't have access to everything that he's, he's given to you. You create a barrier to the life that he wanted you to have. I came that you would have life and life more abundantly, right? So uh, from what we just described here, that's not an abundant life. Amen? And who would want to live that way? Which says this, if we as the believers walk in this divine favor and flourish like nourished plants abundant with water, then we should be showing the outsiders that are not under the ark of safety how this would improve their lives. So they should not be looking at us and seeing the same stuff they're going through. They should be looking at us and saying, wow, what is it that you're doing? Or, or, you know, and then we can say, it's nothing I'm doing. Let me show you what I have access to. Right? Because we're at a time now where things are so wicked and times are so difficult for people, they need to see the light, right? And that's what we have to do. So we have to work at this as, as believers until it says we are changed from glory to glory. We are changed that we should start to look like him. Right? So it talks about, um, you know, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That wasn't just Messiah. Messiah set us up so that when people see us, they can say the same thing. I know this person. They come in the name of the Lord. The light, the life, the whole thing, right, is coming. And, and listen, that's true prosperity, not the stuff that's been preached and taught about about dollars and cents, because our God didn't create no money, and it's not, that's something that we use on earth, but the point is we are supposed to live in such a way that we have everything. What did he tell Solomon? He told, Solomon asked at eight years old, he said, um, I don't want riches. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, give me wisdom to lead this great people. And the Lord said, what? Well, since you didn't ask for that, you asked for the essential thing, I'm going to give you that and the riches, right? Amen? So that's the attitude we ought to have about it. And then that's what ties into what Pastor Barry has been talking about, better decisions. See, when you are led by the Spirit of God, your decisions are right. They're proper, and they just don't do good for you. They do good for all of humanity, right? So sometimes when we say, well, God, why do you, if we ask him, why did we do it that way? I wanted it done this way, or I asked to have it done this way. God is saying it ain't just about you. It's about all of my creation. So my decisions are made based on that, right? All right, so let's go to verse 5. I acknowledge my sin. Okay, see, I own it. Everybody say, I own it. I own it. I, own it. I did it. That's what he said to you, I, ha I sinned. I had to say that. I, well, you know, I didn't know. I sinned. I just acknowledged it. I acknowledged it, my sin unto thee, and my iniquity. In other words, watch this, my no better. I'm creating some language here. My no better. I acknowledged that I did this, and I knew better. My no better, and I have not hid it. I'm telling you, it's open. I sinned, and I knew better. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and the Lord forgave it the iniquity. What? So he forgave my no better. You knew better, but since you has acknowledged it sincerely and openly, he forgave my iniquity. And, and look, again, there's that sea lie. Think about it. Ponder on that. Think about what would happen. Think about what would happen if you be honest with God. Isn't that something? This statement is in the present tense. So it's not past. This is in the present tense, meaning that David continuously confesses his sins and seeks forgiveness for them. Now listen, that's a lot different than the walking around, floating, holier-than-thou attitude that you see sometime among believers. No. Humbly, I mess up every day, and I'll talk about it. I'm not, I'm not pretending to be anything other than one who stands in the need of everything that God has. So, you know, we've always talked about, uh, Mother Green used to say, uh, the, the way up in God is down. <laughs> That's the, the way up is down, right? So, um, it's in the present tense. David continuously confesses his sins and seeks forgiveness for them. Seeking forgiveness. Now, watch this. If he's seeking it, then that tells you that you may not readily know it's there. God, not only that, I'm looking for a refreshing. Because that's how you know it's lifted. It, it, it's done. I, I'm, I'm in back in good standing with you. Now, I know what they say. You ain't got enough faith if you feel like, well, listen, the truth of the matter is sometimes when we come face to face with how egregious our sins are and we knew better, sometimes it takes a minute for us to get it together. That's human, right? And sometimes it'll come off as not being sin. Well, I, well, I say I ask you to forgive me and then... Now we want to now we want to use the scriptures against the brothers and sisters and say, well, you ought to so and so. Well, first off, if you hurt somebody really bad, you ought to have some compassion for the damage that you've done. That's number one. And if they're still a little angry, it's not for you to call the Torah on them. It's God's Torah, it's not yours. So they have to, you have to allow the Lord to work on them while you be humble enough to just allow them to be human and be hurt for a minute. Yeah. So sometimes you just got to pray and hope that God restore them, and all the while, now you're praying for God to restore them from the damage you've done. But if there's anything you can do to make restitution, you do that. So if you, if you cause them to lose something, how about you restore it or help them to get to it, yeah. right? See, this thing, is, this thing is not like, you know, it's not like the waving of magic wands and all these things. We're talking about real-life situations that have to be dealt with. Now, when you're sincerely doing all that you can for your brother and sister that you wronged or hurt, then you continue to do that. Not giving up the fact that, well, they, they just won't receive me. That's between them and God. But that doesn't mean you don't stop trying to be loving and kind and do the things that you're supposed to do. Because if you're honest about it, you did this, you caused it. And anybody can appreciate somebody who's real about what they did and the also the realization that you are trying to fix it. Best you can. Amen? All right, so... so when David was confronted by Nathan, he responded with a heartfelt confession with the words, I sinned to God, acknowledging the fact that what he did with Bathsheba, now he did this with another human being, but he said, I sinned against God. Right? Because all things go. So Yeshua cleared that up real simple. When I was hungry, you fed me. Right? And they asked him, well, they said, well, well Lord, when did we do this to you? He said, whatever you've done to the least of my little ones, you've done it unto me. So that was a good thing. 
So how much more would it be if you've done bad to your fellow man that that is accounted unto Yeshua as well? See, so if you stop looking at things the way we've been looking at it and understand it from the way it's supposed to be, we're going to start to see love flourish. And when love begins to flourish, the Spirit of God is attracted to it. You will draw him in here. Why? He is love. He's going to show up wherever there's love. Not where there's malice and unforgiveness and not where there's, he's not going to show up. And when he shows up, then his supernatural shows up with him. Right? He's not a God that we made with our own hands. He's supernatural. And here's the thing. Do you know there's only one way to shut, to, to shut down the doubters? There's a lot of people now. There's a lot of stuff going on about, you know, is God real or whatever, whatever. There ain't but one way to shut that down. You can't do it. He has to do it. He has to show up. Because for, for those who are challenging the validity of Yeshua HaMashiach, when he shows up, miraculously, supernaturally, then the only thing left for you to do is flat out reject it, and then there's a place for you after that. Right. I mean, nothing else to say about that. But we, we're not going to convince anybody, and there's nowhere written in here that I found that said we had to. But what he said for us to do is follow me. He said, follow me and do what I said do. Whether they decide, that's left up to me. It ain't left up to you, so no need you getting angry and upset with nobody because they don't believe like you believe. That's not your call. That's on him. So we should be able to suffer any rejection. Man, get out of my face. Okay. All right, brother, I'm gone. Put them, put them to the throne now. God, you work on them. Because I can't do it. And certainly, if you get angry with them about, the re, about rejecting the, the, the life, because that's what it is, rejecting the, the way, the truth, and the life, well, then you don't have the way and the truth and life in you. He didn't say get mad with them. Just like if your brother and sister don't forgive you, he didn't say get mad with them. Well, they won't forgive me, so I'm going to act this way to him. No, he said, keep coming. Didn't he keep coming for us? Yes, ma'am. That's why he said, follow me, and I will show you how to be That's fishermen right. of men. That's right. Follow me. He didn't say follow your right. own ways. That's right. And that's when there is increase, and that's when there is fruit. That's right. Because if you're not following him, you can't bear fruit. That's right. And (laughs) the same bait don't work for all fish. Come on, give me that. Yeah, I want to. I want everybody. I want your input. Turn that thing on. There you go. This is so timely because the uh, Wednesday night, as a matter of fact, I had a dream. And in this dream, somebody gave me the scripture, Luke 5 and 10. And at the end of Luke 5 and 10 is when Yeshua said, I'm going to make you fishermen of men. So then I come in here. <laughs> That's what y'all are talking about. Bing. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that great? So the thing is, you know, and if you talk to fishermen, they know different kind of fish use this kind of lure, that kind of, they don't respond to certain things. So you have to know. He said, I will make you, I will make you, not you will make yourself. And that's the reason why uh, for a time period, you know, just, and I'm not knocking anything, don't get me wrong, but what I'm talking about is, let me be clear. I'm a teacher of this house. And I'm speaking to this people. 
because God has mission, has specific things for every branch of his kingdom. So I'm talking to EWC. Now, anybody who's listening to the mail that's going out to EWC and receive it and accept it, then, oh, that's fine. Because we also got too much battling going on in the kingdom, and we all supposed to be working on the same thing. So I, I have no time for any of that. I don't have time for that. Okay? So let's go to verse 6. And by the way, in verse 5, that's what David said when Nathan confessed, when, when, when Nathan approached him and gave him the parable and he recognized it was him, David didn't say anything other than, I have sinned. He didn't give no excuse, but, you know, I did it because, but I thought, no. He said, I have sinned. That was it, right? For this shall everyone that is godly, watch this, everybody who's what? Godly. In other words, anyone who's trying to be like the Lord, because that is our goal. It's not to create some new uh, superstar Christian. No, it's to be like him. Everyone who is godly, pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. So he's saying, so if you're godly, before you start asking for a bunch of stuff, first pray that God forgive you for your transgressions. Yeah. So that starts off your prayer life. And, and of course, we all think that we so special that we could just, you know, walk up stinky and ask. Let me tell you something. If one of our brothers and sisters who are less fortunate, and it happens, because we human, come in our midst and they've been living on the street, may not be too pleasant. If you don't have God within you, you got to get past the smell. So if it's that way for us, God got to get past the smell of us too. So everybody easily receives somebody who smells good and look good. But when somebody ain't looking so what? Let's be honest about the first reaction, because it is why. And the reason why I'm, I'm giving you this kind of example is because at first, it's offensive. So that means you have to do something with the offense. You got to get through it in order for you to minister what needs to be done. Well, who got through the offense first? God had to get through our offenses in order to do what he needed to do for us. And guess what? He didn't fail the task. He got through our offense and did what we had to do. Because the scripture says, while we were yet sinners, stinky, while we were yet sinners, he Christ died for us. So he was able to get past the offense. And with love and compassion, he came after us. And he got through the offense. He got through the stinky part. So if you're godly, you will pray in a time when God can be found. Because you know God can re remove his known presence from us. He's, he is, this is the great part about him. He is everywhere at the same time, but you don't have to know it. You can be totally unaware that he's present. Surely in the floods of great waters, they shall not come nigh unto you. So he's saying, seek him when he can be found. Right? And this is what it says here in the, in the Jewish Bible. It says, this is what everyone faithful. So it says godly, but he says, this is the way everyone who's faithful should pray at a time when you can be found, talking to the Lord. Then when the flood waters are raging, they will not reach to you or to him. They will not reach you because now, watch this, 
because you've already prepared yourself to be in his safety and in his presence. So you're worried. Listen, listen. So we have to check ourselves. If we got a lot of worry and things going on, then maybe we have not found him at a time when he could be found. And now that the floodwaters is coming at you, and, that, and that's just talking about life rushing at you, now you got a little fear. And it was beautifully illustrated last week that even while he was in his humanity, he still was able to say, yet not my will, but yours be done. So that means we will go through that. But the key to it is when we've done this part, when we've been faithful, so keep that in mind when you say everyone that is godly or everyone who is faithful will pray and confess their sins first. kind of like your child, right? Your child just walk up on you, and you know they ain't been naughty, and they ain't been doing what they're supposed to do, and they walk, and have them, and sometimes I say, and they got the nerve to ask me to go somewhere? <laughs> and they've been acting up? Because kids will do that to you. They haven't been doing nothing right. You've been fussing at them, you've been chastising them, and then they'll look at you, because remember now, the thing with a child like that is, all they're concerned about is what they want. And we're like that. Why? Because all of us will always qualify as a child Amen. in God's eyes. So, you know, you know, even though we've been chastised and all that, your child will still come back and ask you for a favor. And you're going, what? <laughs> Isaiah 55, 6. Can we have that up there? Isaiah 55, 6. Well, we got 15 minutes. We can, we can, we're going to do it. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. So that's where that came from. Seek God while he may be found. You know why? Because if he doesn't want you to find him, you will not. He may make you wait it out. He might do one of these on you. Okay. Lord, you because, Lord, I'm right here, but you can't see me. I'm right here, but right now I'm not responding. Maybe because you need to repent first. Go back to Psalm 32, and let's go to... Whew. Back to, you go stay there at seven, but let me finish this out. We should pray that affliction should not reach us at all. Yes. We should pray that. Yes. Because without afflictions, one is not cleansed. So when we are afflicted by what we've done, it causes us to be cleansed. Now, this is, this is uh, tied into Psalm 51 when he said, wash me with hyssop, which was the ancient scrub brush. Anybody ever took a bath with one of them old scrub brushes? You're not scrubbing your skin with that. That's not comfortable. But he's saying, wash me with hyssop. So in other words, to take you through a little something to cause you to know that sin is not the life you want to live in. It causes you to be cleansed. So when, and in 1 9, John 1 9, he says, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us, which means I may put you through a little affliction just so you can re be reminded not to come back here again. So while we're while we calling it the devil, it's God trying to cleanse you. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from the trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. Right? I like the way it says here. You are my hiding place. You are a hiding place for me. You will keep me from distress. You will surround me with songs of deliverance. 
You will keep me from distress. When, I, when I'm hidden in the Lord, I am free from distress. Right? When God continues to uphold you against your enemies, here we go, this verse right here, uphold you against your enemies, you will be surrounded with exclamations of praise. So songs of deliverance, watch this, is not the songs that we say, I'm going to be something in the Lord. No, the songs of deliverance are songs that you praise God with. Amen. <laughs> not how you're going to win. No, songs of deliverance are songs that you praise God with for his deliverance. Right? It's a difference. Because a lot of times, we, you know, in, in the gospel scene sometimes, they sing songs about what we're going to be. But the praise belongs to God. Well, you know, some of, them, some of those sell better. They sell better, so... They don't talk about songs of deliverance is a song of praise to God because he has delivered you. In order to keep this, in order to keep this security, you must keep his word. So if repentance is a part of his word, in order to keep this security in God, you've got to repent. Continuously. Not when you get ready. Here, David, verse 8. Let's go to verse 8 so we can finish this. We got just three more verses. I'm um, looking. Ten minutes, we can do it. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. Right? And it says, I will instruct and teach you in this way that you are to go I will give you counsel. My eyes will be watching you. See that? I will give you counsel, and then I'm going to watch to see what you do. Will you, will you hear my voice and move? Right. Right? You see the difference? Here David speaks of him teaching others to repent due to his experience with the self-improvement through repentance. So what are we working on when we repent? Our self-improvement. He will watch his flowers to point out to them the path to travel. Now, this is what David is saying I will do, but who did it first? The Lord. He did it to him first. You can't give godly counsel if you haven't received it. So before you can tell anybody anything, you have to first learn it yourself. And not just have learned about it, but begin to master it and walk in it. Amen? Verse 9. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in, with bit and bridle, lest they, come, lest they come near unto thee. So verse 9 here says, don't be like a horse or a mule who has no understanding. That he has to be curbed with a bit and bridle, or else it won't come near you. So he's saying a horse is headstrong, and a mule is headstrong to do what they want to do. And the only way you can control them is by bit and bridle. And when you pull back on the bit, it hurts. So he's saying, to you, why would I have to continue to afflict you to get you to do what you're supposed to do? <laughs> a horse and a mule cannot differentiate between a person who is treating them well and that that's trying to harm them. God is not trying to harm you. He's trying to get you straight. So you have to have enough understanding to know this is God trying to lead me in a direction and stop talking so much about the enemy. Because the enemy can't even touch you 
We just read about in dis I'm not in distress. So he can't touch you unless he says so. He warns us not to be like a dumb beast and only respond to the whip. Man possesses the intellect to be bridled by the Torah to do God's bidding. If the body is untamed, it can damage the soul, just as the wild beast can injure the rider. So, your, so, so the, the soul is the rider of the body in a horse situation. So you can be thrown off the horse and get hurt if you're the rider. Verse 10. Got 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall encompass him about. Right? <laughs> Many are the torments of the wicked, but grace surrounds those who trust in Adonai. Now, trust is another word for faith. So if you trust in him, do what you're supposed to do. So don't, don't perceive in this verse that the wicked is the non-believer. No. It's the believer who refuses to trust in the word of God and have true faith. That's the wicked. Because an unbeliever doesn't even know what he's supposed to do. So it's talking about us. Be glad in Adonai, verse 11. Be glad in Adonai, rejoice you righteous, shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Right? The afflictions are both to the wicked and to the just. However, the righteous do not come, become melancholy because they are also receive mercy and kindness even in the midst of afflictions. So when things are happening to you, don't start mumbling and complaining because while you have, may have received some afflictions, you have received abundance of mercy. Amen. So don't get focused on that. It's better to rehearse his mercy and his kindness and take the focus off of your little affliction. And I say little meaning that that's not a blanket thing because if, if, if the doctor tells you something terrible, that's a, that's a hard affliction. But remember the grace and the mercy that God has shown you because you need that to take you through if you're going to overcome a strong affliction or something serious. They also realize that the affliction is for their cleansing, making them worthy for the world to come. And in verse 11, it speaks of you who trust in God rejoice in the confidence and the goodness make others cry out with joy by sharing your experiences. The word of our testimony. That's why, see, that's why some folks that may not understand why pastor wants to have the testimony service, he understands these verses. Yeah, yeah. Because the preach word sometimes when you're in a numb state, sometimes doesn't break through like it's supposed to. It depends, because we all are living in and, we, and listen, and you say, okay, I can't identify with that right now because you're going through something else. But then there may be a testimony in the midst that will, boom, clear you up right away. So the thing is, God knows how to get to you if we use everything that he gave us in the kingdom. Because sometimes people sit right in the midst, word after word after word. And that's why it's also important for us as leaders to seek out God, what do you want me to say? It's, it's fine to study, it's fine, it's fine to do all of that, but again, whatever we're studying, we still need to, you know, check on the Lord and allow him to even infuse whatever we've studied. Amen. If he doesn't infuse what we've studied, nothing. 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 Right? It could become just an intellectual exercise. Now understand this, but when, when it's miraculous, then the Spirit of God will increase your intellect, if I can say that right. You understand? If it's a rhema word, it'll fuse, infuse your intellect. 
And then when you're using it, it'll be correct. Because it's infused with the Spirit of God. It's a knowledge beyond what you can just think of. Amen? So that's why they couldn't trick Jesus. They knew all kinds of stuff. They knew well. They had studied well and, and, and all the same. They knew all of that. But when, but when it came down to talking to him, they couldn't measure up. Because he had the intellect and the spirit. So when he spoke, it changed things. Amen? And they couldn't trip, they couldn't trip him up. Amen? So the key to, for us, which is why I wanted to teach on this, the, the thing is repentance is a cornerstone for us. We cannot operate in God no matter how much we desire to without being in a state of repentance. Because then we're trusting not on, we're not, that's what it means to say don't lean to your own understanding. Because we will make a decision wrong even after we've studied. We can still make a wrong decision. Amen? So it's really important that we do that. And, that, and as a body, that's what we're trying to seek God for. We want him to run it, not us. We just want to be the hose. And the good thing about it is the hose does get the water before the grass. Amen? God bless you all. Thank you. Amen.